And we're recording. Good evening, good evening, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. It's your girl, Anaya A of the Anaya A Show with our special contributor, co-host, and commentator, Mr. Dion Powell, who's making funny faces over there, but that's okay. We still love him, right? And uh, tonight- Only face I got. What? It's the only face I got. No, but you were doing something weird. Like you were like looking off to the, you know what? Listen here, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in and for joining us tonight. As you know, it's never a dull moment with the two of us, right? And so tonight what we wanted to do was a quick follow-up in regards to a very empowering conversation we had on tonight's show, right, Dion? Sure. Sure. And so I wanted Dion to share some great motivational pieces as well as some hope in the midst of this darkness. I literally mm -hmm. copied what he stated earlier during our live segment um, after we interviewed Miss Arlene Mullen of the you know, dialysis patient advocate group. And we just know that sometimes we need a little hope in the midst of the darkness. So Dion, please share some of that uh, greatness that you had earlier with the people now. Well, I'm Dion Powell. I'm a chaplain uh, with the um, New York State uh, Chaplain Task Force. I took my uh, class. It's like, you know, I think it was like five or eight Saturdays in a row. And then my minister, Reverend Dr. Rivera. Then you have Reverend Moran, who's in charge of the entire task force for the state. So we do hospitals, hospices where people die. We do prison ministry, which I've done before too. But I'm just a helper, you know. I'm too spiritually mature for that all things. But I thought chapter was the right role. My my uh, minister was like, "Oh, Dean, gonna be trapped." You know, pressure. But you know what? I'm gonna do it. And the class was great. And I think I have the skill set necessary to do what I gotta do. You know, Lord's work. Plus this Christian mysticism that I'm looking into right now uh, to get that order. You know, because you know, there's the or different organizations that happen to that kind of stuff. The free Masons, the Illuminati, different organizations that that um, tap into this like essence of things. And I believe this is a Christian order I need to be a part of because I was tapped by the Freemasons, but doing my research, it's not for me and what it's about with the higher power that they're dealing with. But a Christian sect of the Eastern uh, spirituality and access to different uh, healing powers, you know, going to how Jesus said we'll do great things in him and mm -hmm. how to, you know, the faith of the mustard seed that actually moved the mountain, kind of Star Wars Force stuff. So this is the hope I bring into the, dark the darkness. Me, my art passed, and First thing I try to do is fast, you know, mm -hmm. porno. Fast from the, um, from foods and things like that. And so far I have like canned beans at home and rice, which I missed my first time. And I'm gonna try to go without meat and dairy for, I guess the six months are much challenge. But I love milk, like cake and stuff like that. So I can drink water all day, every day, especially hot water <laughs> in the morning and nighttime. So we'll see how I do. I'm gonna try to take the challenge, just in honor of my aunt. That's a special or fast and praying before God I can get through it. And I encourage you to fast because if you're fasting and not praying, it's just like through the spiritual component. Um, you might want to sign up for the daily bread e blast because you know I have those little daily bread books and shirts. Yeah. We actually have an e blast so like every morning, a little Bible quote. You can do a Bible challenge reading from beginning to end. And for the people that are secular, like, ah, white Jesus. One thing I challenge you to do uh, is this, that one of the most dangerous classes, two actually in college I took, that both a million dollars worth it. One was Black Studies, and the other one is English Honors, Reading the Bible, Peace of Literature. So if any secular people aren't feeling Christianity, which is fine, they should read the Bible as a piece of literature. And there are colloquialisms, you know, things that are interesting that apply to life. For example, you know, those, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil, right? And, you know, Jesus said that it's not money, the tool, it's the love of it. And I believe our culture is suffering from that problem because they're all out of money right now. They always say they love money, but look how toxic the lifestyle of loving money causes when you go against the higher power. But that's just one example of the many, you know, stories or parables or comic book, whatever you want to call it, buyer. but the essence of it, like any book there is, there's a lot to learn that you can find, you know, for life, for yourself, help. But it's always good to have the spiritual component. And back to you. You're so funny. Even in the midst of the positive segment, you still find a way of making me laugh. Thank you, Dion. Because you're absolutely right. Every point, you're on point. 
um, yeah, so I just wanted us to come back on and, and share that information with the people um, because we did have an exciting but pretty long segment tonight. And, uh, you know, Dion, um, what you said is really cool. And let's, let's ask you this real quick, Dion. What made you decide to go into getting your chaplain's, you know, certification? Well, our minister, you know, they see the light um, in me because I'm a very, I do the work of Christianity, you know, I'm very patient, humble, servant's heart, anybody needs me, I'm there. Um, so yeah, you know, I helped out, you know, I was like the deacon's right hand man. And he's like, listen, you know, you gotta, you know, get it together, become a chaplain, because, you know, you help out with the prison ministry, this, that, and third, and you need this, because, you know, he needs more leaders in the church and help me spiritual growth. But I resisted, you know, I said, you know, I'm not personally mature to do the whole lifestyle ordainment of the like Christ, the Christ, a thousand percent like everybody else, because I don't want to screw Yeah, that part of the new chaplain task force. Very I learned from the chaplaincy book uh, myself with suicide and mental illness. You know, when you know somebody with addiction or mental illness or any problems, the first thing you say that really breaks the ice and the spirit feeling uh, uh, is when you say, listen, it's not your fault, right? If you're in a hospital, someone's on a deathbed, or someone's like substance abuse, or you know, through a drug situation, even if they're a prostitute or, or you know, we were talking about trauma molesters being, uh, if you know somebody with a child molesters being, you can't do that, you're not really Christian. But the first thing you tell people, like you force out of uh, things like that, and then you pray, and I like to enter religious forces or the, um, I thought it was called, um, universal as a chaplain, I'm neutral, right? I'm a Christian, but they are chaplains in other religions. They say, you know, do you need a prayer call? How can I uh, help you in the hospital with your culture? You know, do you need a, um, a G chain, uh, your G material? Do you need, excuse me, a kufi? And then when they open up to you as a chaplain, you know, the way the word is proselytization, it's a vocabulary word. You can't do it, but you can say, well, you know what? I'm going to pray for you. Most people are atheists, you know, they see the light eventually, and this is the time, you know, you bring to God. That's People say it's going to pray for you. A lot of people say no, right? right? And actually, one of the hardest areas, and now you're going to like this for a chaplain, right. is actually the maternity ward. Can you believe that? Mm. So, I believe it because sometimes you have to deal with these babies that are born prematurely or even um, they pass mm -hmm. away and they have a lot of questions. And a lot of sadness is that what it's you're a challenge to deal with single parents and families arguing and sometimes babies dying and the fights. It's okay. Anyway, so I said, well, you know, if you give people a job and you feed the sheep, at least one sheep like myself will come back to the church and give. It's more worth it. So if you train your sheep get resources, access to jobs and capital, then they'll see the church as a community. Because me, I'm big on faith-based property being the temple, the community and light, the community over seven days a week. So I use current programs, the school, Christian school, after school programs, nurseries, you know, training centers, job resources, you know. Once you're a beacon of the community, you can build up the man. Uh, the connection is going in and out. I'm back. This whole service, like I've said, I've been trying to get this thing rectified for the past couple of weeks, but it will be rectified in the name of Jesus after I just dropped a few things. What was that sound? You okay over there? I'm okay. God is faithful. You hit the nail on the head. I just wanted to say thank you. As you know, um, we've been having glitches in our system, but you are so profound in what you stated. I was listening even through we were, you know, even though we we're going through this in and out thing, um, right now it's a very hard time with the service because obviously nobody's working with the internet. Um, and I've spent hours and I've been walking back and forth trying to find somebody to help me. But I know God is. Actually, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. All right, politically, you know, you're Haitian, right? Right. And Brooklyn, the problem is that they, a lot of black people, even most Indian people, feel so hideous to get over. Now, what do you know about that? About what? They get over? All right, politically in New York City. Yeah. Yes. 
in Brooklyn especially, a lot of people feel as though the Haitians are taking over in the black community and you know, West Indian community, the Haitian Haiti's taking over politically of New York City and beyond. Now, how do you feel about that? And I can explain it to you if you want. No, no, no. I totally get it. But how the heck are they taking over when they only have three people that represent the whole population in state and in city? Well, that's a good question. For example, Brooklyn is a strange place politically, as I understand it, being from the Bronx and my colleagues there in government, that Brooklyn is like a circle. There's a lot of Black people there. There's right. the American Blacks with their leadership and politics. There's the West Indian Blacks that have the leadership and politics. But now that Haitians slowly but surely are getting uh, political power. And one of the big dogs that I've known in the game, who's nice, but actually behind the scenes, she's like a real pit bull, is New York State Assemblyman Bronnie Bouchard. So do you know who that is? Yeah. That's like a big sister for me. I love her. That's a big dog. So she recently took over Brooklyn's political machine, meaning the Democratic County. She's the first Black woman of, I think, the Brooklyn Democratic Party. And a lot of Black people feel slighted with her. And, you know, with, um, uh, there was a, oh, yeah, there's a city council member that already with Farrah Lewis, who's Haitian, and some other people in the Haitian community are getting these dispositions and taking over in Long Island, too. And the reason why Black Americans I spoke to in government and West Indians have a problem with the Haitian community is that they make a lot of deals with the Jews, right? Mm. It's like Eric Adams. They associate with Jews and white people. <laughs> And they're chopping up all the resources and leadership roles in Brooklyn amongst the Blacks, the West Indians, and not the Haitians. So they're like a lot of implying with everybody else is just on the outskirts, you know, doing their own thing and throwing money around. And I think, I wouldn't say manipulate, but they're taking advantage of the fuel, the full situation of us going at each other without divisiveness. And that's a mentality issue. So I just want to see what have you heard of the Haitian grapevine and how do you feel about, you know, Haitians? Like some people feel as though, they can be opportunistic, like the other side of the Hispaniola, which is like the Dominican Republic in the Bronx. So the Dominicans are starting to feel like they're black, not really, but you right. know, some people feel so opportunistic as a culture, and now black and West Indians feel so Haitians are opportunistic as a culture. They may smile on our face, but behind the scenes, they're trying, you know, do what they got to do as their people to make the people succeed. Nothing wrong with that, but you know, I believe in the African diaspora unity. So I want you to speak on that. So, due to the fact that we started this off as a hopeful, positive uh, post and video clip after our show, right, the NIA show with you as the co-host, what we'll do is we'll take this conversation offline, because like you know, I don't do the whole political thing necessarily on record, because it can be very gruesome, and the political arena is something that I participate in. But a lot of the things that I do talk about happen to be behind doors, closed doors, et cetera, because like you know, in this arena, things could either make you or break you, kill you, smother you, or make you a whole lot of money. And I'm not one to um, judge anybody. I'm Haitian American, yes. However, um, it's a very touchy subject. Let's put it that way. But let's talk more offline. And if I can, I will definitely get you connected to some of the leaders in the Haitian community if that's something that you'd like to do, Dion, because that's who I, I am. Have some connections. I have some connections to the Haitian community in politics and, and um, uh, Brooklyn and beyond. But let me give you, let's, let's switch gears. Do you want to talk about, is she want a theme is faith based? You want to talk about how the Hasidic Jews are like the only people in New York City that are like exempt from this social distancing? Because the thing is, a lot of people don't know about the Jewish culture is that when someone dies, especially in the city of Jews, you have to put the body in the ground as soon as humanly possible, right? A lot, people understand, right? a lot of people understand that, you know, some people say, you know, I'm anti-Semitic, but I like I explain, listen, as a person that's born in the South Bronx since the 80s, I never really had a concept of Jews until college. In Catholic school, a little bit, but encountering, playing with them as children and learning their whole culture, we don't really know in the South Bronx, right? right. Because we had the white flight where we scared them off. And then our parents should tell us and show that, you know, it was the Jews that were the only in the South Bronx. They took all the insurance money and, you know, they saw us coming into the Bronx being successful. And that's why they tried to destroy us. Mm. So long story short, the Jews in Brooklyn are not doing social distancing. They're having, you know, the, the rabbi died or whatever. There's a whole flood in the street of people. And so a lot of people are saying, well, the governor and the mayor, they want to do a thousand dollar summonses for people that fail the social distance, but we're like, well, especially both with these things. I said, well, 
I'm not anti Semitic. You always have to pre first it like that. But I'm like, oh, what about these Jews? They're like a, a million Jews in the street in Brooklyn with this funeral situation. Cops are just sitting there in their cars playing the, the, the automated voice stuff, you know, social distancing and warning, but they do little of nothing. So, but, and I, I would like friend. to say about that, I will openly state this, the Jews have this very weird way of running every damn thing. And obviously their money is long and strong. And if we did like the Jews, the Jews, maybe our situations would be a lot better talking about you know different cultures and politics etc they're everywhere from managing every media source to every political arena to every industry because they know how to work together it's not going to be easy for us to dismantle these people and make them do any damn thing because they don't listen to anybody because they run everything so at the end of the day it pisses me off that they get away with murder, literally, and then they have the whole world like at their beck and call. And that I can openly state because it's a problem when you break the law, the law excuse me, of the land, but you utilize this whole stigma um, that you're Jewish and it's basically okay because of your, you know, whatever, your beliefs. Side note, talking about that, you know, it perplexes me to the core that, you know, Jesus was born in this era and it was basically the Jews that literally did him in. And yet we still have this love and like, I don't know, people bow down to them and I don't get it, but that's a whole nother topic. We're going to end off on a positive note and this conversation we could actually take off air as well. Because you know what? Anytime you say anything against them, somehow, somewhere, you're black boxed and things like that. Because they run everything. Like the LGBT community. That's another conversation. Not for tonight. So let's end with this Bible verse because that's how we started this thing. And then you and me could have another combo, maybe another time too. But you know what we should do though, on, in all honesty, we should hold some of these elected officials accountable as to why they're allowing them to do what they're doing. Because if they let one sector, and I will say this openly, if they allow for one sector to do this, it doesn't matter what their beliefs are, they're still breaking the laws of the land. And somebody has to be held responsible because we know several cases of Jewish people contracting the corona, dying, and they're literally putting people at risk. So with that being said, let's skip this Jewish belief. Let's skip the Kabbalah, Kabbalah, Torah, whatever, Shalem, Halem. You know, let's skip that and let's go down to the nitty gritty of things. You're laughing, but I'm serious. This is a health crisis and I don't care what religion you are. It's not fair and it's not right. And if you don't want to be held accountable, go back to Israel. How about that? Because at the end of the day, I have to be realistic because people need accountability and that's the bottom line. Okay. So let's share this last Bible verse and then we could take this conversation to another place at another time. But you know what? We're going to overcome Dion as we've sang for a long time in the, you know, the hymnals. But right now I love this scripture for this topic and this message tonight. And it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So with that being said, and you know, in speaking tonight, I'm happy that I've learned more about you, your beliefs and what you stand for and know more about me. I don't do the whole political thing openly because it could put me in a lot of problems, but you know what? I like the fact that you're asking these questions because sometimes we need to be put in the spotlight literally to share different things that concern us because we don't know whom we're helping. We don't know if we're giving people an extra boost to be a little bolder in their faith, in their political views and in their lifestyle. So that's what I have to say about that. Um, do you have any closing remarks, Mr. Dion? Uh, yeah. Nothing controversial. No, you didn't give me a chance. Uh, you said close your remark, man. You know, as a politician, I probably could pontificate at great length, but I was going to say certain sweet, you know, 
Uh, stay safe and always follow the news. You don't have to be politically savvy to follow the news. And uh, don't let the image of Trump deter you. There's always a media outlet you could focus on, either a black channel, the Grio, or something impartial, uh, allegedly NPR or BBC, get a different international perspective. But just keep watching the news and stay informed. Thank you, Dion. And I didn't put you on blast on that last one. I just knew when you started doing this, <laughs> it was a wrap. <laughs> I don't like this thing, but women love it. So I have no choice. <laughs> This one girl on church said, finally, I look like a man. Was that a compliment? You know what? We'll talk later. Have a good night, Dion. Have a good night, everybody. We'll share this momentarily on our social media platforms. Nighty night. You're the best. Hold on. How do we stop this thing? <laughs>